Yep. All right, welcome everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started in just a moment. I'm just making sure we're getting everybody in from the waiting room. And as a reminder, uh, please go ahead and mute yourselves if you haven't already done so, just so we can cut down on the amount of noise that we have throughout the meeting. <laughs> All right. So welcome everybody to our Apple Leaf Curling Midge IPM webinar. Uh, this has been an emerging pass up here in Northern New York for the past couple of years. So when I was in Michigan and heard Christy give a, a really great talk on the topic, I reached out to her shortly thereafter and said, hey, it'd be great if, if you could give this talk to, to growers in New York. So that brought us to today. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Basedow, and I'm a tree fruit specialist with the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program here in Eastern New York in the Champlain Valley. And I'm co-hosting this meeting today with Janet Van Zorn of the Lake Ontario Fruit Program. And behind the scenes, we also have Jen Stan, our Champlain Valley technician, who's gonna be helping out managing the DEC credits today. So just a couple of ground rules before we get started. Uh, it's been a little while since I've done a Zoom webinar. So if it has been for you, uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, we do ask that you keep yourself muted during the presentation until we get to the Q&A portion. So you should be able to find that on your screen. You can toggle down to the, to the uh, Zoom bar there and you should, should see that mute unmute button. So please make sure that you're muted and that your video is turned off. On that bar, you'll also find the chat box. You can click there and if you have questions throughout the course of the meeting, go ahead and type them into that chat box there. That's also where you're going to find the link to the Qualtrics surveys that you're going to use to fill out if you are looking for DEC credits today. So more on that, we do have one credit available in categories 22, 1A, and 10 today. So we're gonna go ahead and put the Qualtrics survey into the chat box now. So you're going to wanna to click on that and you're gonna fill in a little bit of information. We just need your full name as it appears on your pesticide ID and also your applicator ID number. So just submit that and do that for everybody on the farm that's watching with you today. And you're gonna to need to do that at the beginning and the end of the meeting and that one for the end of the meeting is going to be in a separate link that we'll send out near the end of the meeting. If you haven't done so already as well, uh, please make sure you send a photocopy of your ID to me at mrb254 at cornell.edu by the end of the day on Friday. And that way we'll be able to get you your credits. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker of the day. Our speaker is going to be Christy Grigg McGuffin, and she has been the horticulture IPM specialist for apples with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs since 2011. She's responsible for knowledge mobilization and applied research for the apple industry in Ontario, Canada. Her area of focus is evaluating new technologies and strategies for managing key orchard pests, as well as emerging pest issues, including both native and invasive species. She's the editor of several IPM resources, including Publication 360, Guide to Fruit Production, On Fruit Blog, Orchard Network Newsletter, and the Ontario Crop IPM. She holds a master's in environmental biology and toxicology from the University of Guelph, where she focused on resistance management of apple moth pests. So with that, I'm going to turn my screen over to Christy. Great, thanks, Mike. Let me just get myself up here. All right, thumbs up. Can you see it? Looks good. You're good to go. Wonderful. Thank you. So thanks so much for the invite. And uh, I'm happy to, to see the nice mix of names on this group. Um, so uh, yeah, so we'll get into it. We're going to be talking about 
something that's become a, a pretty um, pretty common issue in Ontario um, and across Canada, a number of other provinces as well. And it sounds like kind of spreading uh, to be a little bit more of an emerging issue across the, the Northeast. So um, I before we get going, just because I am a new face for a lot of people, I just wanted to kind of introduce, I know Mike just did that uh, bio for me, but just a little bit of uh, background in terms of you know, what it's Ontario apple growing is all about. Um, and so we are the, the main apple producers in Canada, um, pretty well spread out across um, southwestern Ontario. Uh, we've got kind of five main apple growing regions, you can see kind of the percentage of acreage and in, in all those regions. Um, my involvement, though, in the industry, um, I'm down, I'm coming across, uh, coming to you from uh, from the north shores of Lake Erie down in Simcoe, Ontario. And, uh, and I work out of the Ontario um, Horticulture Research Station. And so I'm with the government um, and I'm working with, uh, my, my primary role is extension. So I work directly with the industry and, and growers, um, particularly with their, their pest management program. So that said, we'll get on. What today we're gonna to be talking about though is uh, leaf curling midge. So I'm gonna cover, we've got a good chunk of time. So I'm gonna kind of start from the basics and work all the way across. We're still really learning a lot about this um, from its biology to, to how to manage. It's a really difficult pest to try and manage just because of its behavior, which we'll get into. Um, and, uh, and the fact that kind of our, our traditional insecticides really don't really do a, an optimal job for it. So we'll kind of cover biology and how we monitor, and then we'll get into control. We've been doing quite a bit of look at some of the biological control options from um, parasitoids to just our, our native predators that are around. Uh, and then I'll finish up with what we're doing right now from a chemical control standpoint. So just to take a step back with leaf curling midge. So this is actually an invasive insect. Um, it came from Europe, but uh, it has been around for a number of decades now. So it was first really, um, a lot of reports really started coming in kind of in the 1980s in terms of the management needs for it. Um, but especially in Ontario, at least, it's really been kept at bay. It's kind of been a minor pest, not really a huge issue and something that say nurseries or, um, or new plantings have concerns about, but in terms of established orchards, it really hasn't been an issue. Um, in the last probably about 10 years or so, it's become an increasing problem more and more and in established orchards. Um, and so I've got just kind of a couple, you know, ideas on there of, you know, possibly why it's becoming an issue. In Canada, we've seen a really significant change to our broad spectrum insecticides and access to them. Um, we're basically down to one organophosphate option, which is imidan, um, and the use pattern for that, it, it doesn't fit in with control for leaf curling midge. Um, and what we're seeing with the loss of those broad spectrum insecticides is now a reemergence of all of these other pests that have kind of been kept at bay. So leaf curling midge being one of them, things like scale, that sort of stuff is kind of on, on the rise again. Um, now that we're kind of dealing with these more reduced risk and really targeted insecticides. So we've also got that transition over to um, different training sy systems. So now that we're moving towards the high density, smaller trees, we're really pushing vigor um, and the pruning, the, the pruning tactics have changed a lot. So we have a lot of new growth and, and really um, succulent tissue, which I'll talk about with the biology that this, this is what they thrive in and that's what they feed on. So having these kind of young succulent, succulent trees um, is really helping to promote the, the populations. We're also seeing an extended length and activity. So now their emergence is typically a bit between kind of five to nine degrees. Um, I've had traps out, putting them out in the snow when, when we're at green tip um, and getting them getting traps, getting the, the adults in the traps, and I've trapped all the way up until November and still getting them. So their activity can be really long. Um, and now that we're having warmer springs and warmer falls, then it gives the chance for those populations to really build up. Um, I've got a couple other things. I mean, I put, you know, warmer soils on there as well as a possibility too. There's, I think there's a lot of factors that can kind of play into why it is that we're seeing these um, and having, you know, maybe more overwintering success with those warmer soils. 
um, or, or perhaps warmer winters um, that we don't see that overkill. So there, there's kind of um, a number of varieties is why we're seeing this increase, but nonetheless, it was originally thought that this was kind of a, as I said before, a nursery and a young planting issue. Um, but we're seeing a lot more development in established orchards and that there can be quite significant impact, especially I've got there when you get about 60% or higher leaf area damage. So that's the terminal growth when that starts to be damaged. Um, we really do see an impact in terms of the, um, the photosynthetic abilities and, and it's a you know, winter hardiness. Um, it can really impact the tree structure, especially for young trees and stunt the growth. So it does have fairly significant impact, even though it's not a direct pest to the, the apples themselves. So we are now, it kind of started, we had sort of hot spots in the province um, of where we were seeing this, but, um, but it's now pretty well spread across Ontario. It varies in terms of the, um, the extent damage. Um, the further you know, southwest we are in the province, they, they see pretty minimal damage, but we've got other areas heading towards Toronto um, that, uh, that get, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty severe. And it can, we're seeing it on both um, high density as well as our standard blocks. I've got just a picture in the background here. This is an example of, this is a 75 year old Mac. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see, but absolutely every single terminal on that, on that tree has been infested. So it can get really severe on some of those, those trees. So I'm just going to kind of talk, get into the, the biology and, and, you know, what we know of it so far and, and how we're, we're monitoring for it. So leaf curling midge, it is a golf forming midge. So what you're seeing, those curls that happen are not as a result of the insect themselves curling those leaves, but it's triggering a response. When the larvae hatch and start to feed, they're triggering a response in the plant um, and it's causing those curls. They're really, really tight curls, quite brittle. So as you try to unroll them, um, they tend to break and they can be pretty difficult to unroll, but that's the leaf itself that's responding to the feeding that's causing these curls and those larvae then develop inside the leaf, which I mean makes it very difficult to try and manage it um, because trying to get any sort of uh, contact with the, those insecticides, they're, they're well sheltered. So um, there's five instars in terms of the, the growth of the larva, and this is important. I'm gonna talk about it in the monitoring. It's important to know the different instar stages because when we're monitoring, what we're doing is looking for the color changes. So you can see in the bottom left corner, those first two instars, um, the larva are quite kind of a creamish off-white color. Um, Size-wise, you know, they're, I would say that they're probably about the size of a grain of rice. Um, usually in those curls, you're getting about 20 to 30 or so, um, sometimes more larva, depending on the size of the leaf. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, they're this kind of off-white color. As they start to mature and go through those later stage instars, they start to turn towards an orange color. You can see this, the, the color change here in the bottom right, um, starting to go towards that orange. When they're about to pupate, so when they're in their the last instar stage, they'll turn a neon orange and it will be very vibrant color. Um, and at that point, then you know that they're about to pupate. And what they do is they actually drop down into the soil right at the drip line and they'll pupate in the first couple inches of the soil. So now this, the, the, uh, the movement of that late instar larva um, down to the ground, it's really triggered by rainfall. It needs to have some moisture. So we've had periods, um, summers of extreme drought, and it really delays the development quite significantly at this stage. So there have been times where they have pupated directly within the leaf themselves, but, uh, but typically it's um, a bit of an extended development. And then as soon as you get a rainfall, you get a flush then of all of the midge starting to drop to the ground. So you'll see kind of some variation depending on the, um, the, the season and what the season is like. So the adults themselves, um, they, they're small midges, um, so, you know, very, very tiny little flies. Um, and the obvious thing about them, and Mike had a picture of it as well um, on his opening screen, so you can see the beaded antennae is very common and very long legs. Now, this picture that I have on the bottom corner here is, um, 
is of a midge that's trapped on a, a sticky trap. And a really common thing for being able to identify them on sticky traps is that they actually have this red hemolymph, um, these little, this little tiny bead of red that is below them. Um, and that's really common for leaf curling midge and is a good way to differentiate between some of those other midges and flies that may, may be caught, um, that that's kind of the distinguishing characteristic that you see that happens. So now the picture that I have, the larger picture that I have is a, an image of the female laying her eggs. And the thing about leaf curling midge is that they actually lay their eggs in the newest unfurled leaves on a growing terminal. And so you can see all of these shiny orange, they're kind of oval or bullet shaped um, eggs that, that are laid. And she sticks it right directly in. I've got a video on this next one. Now it's my shaky hands there, but nonetheless, you can see her actually inserting her ovipositor right into that newest terminal. Um, and that's where she uh, she is laying those eggs. So it's, you know, it, from the very beginning, as soon as those larvae hatch, they start to feed on the, the new tissue. and um, and that's where you start to get the curls happening. So it's a difficult thing to manage. Now, in terms of the damage, I mentioned already that they're gall forming. So you're gonna get these tight curls that happen. Um, what these rolls do is that they actually curl upwards. And I'll talk about this in just a couple slides um, to differentiate between some of those pests, those other pests, but they curl upwards towards the mid veins. And these get to be really, really tight curls and quite brittle. The color usually happens almost right out of the gate. You start to see a coloration change in those leaves and it's anywhere from kind of a purplish color to you can see in the top picture to a quite vibrant pink. Um, and, and then the larvae are within those curls. So in terms of um, kind of differentiating between the leaf curling midge and some of our other common pests, um, there's other things that cause these sort of curls, one uh, being leaf rollers. And um, so the, the thing with this, as I mentioned before, that you get that kind of discoloration, the, it's a very brittle, very tight, tight roll with leaf curling midge, whereas something like leaf roller, um, usually the roll is a little bit um, a little bit less, it's not as tight, it's a little bit looser, um, but also com really common is the, the presence of any sort of webbing or, or signs of frass. That's gonna be the differentiation um, if, the, if the leaf roller themselves are still not in that curl. The other one that's commonly misidentified is rosy apple aphid, um, especially when we start getting some of those color changes that can happen with rosy as well. Now the difference is, as I mentioned before, leaf curling midge, they curl upwards towards the mid vein. Since rosy apple aphid is feeding on the underside of the leaf, then the leaves curl downward for rosy apple aphid. So sometimes it can get really confusing, especially when you get kind of a terminal where the leaves are all kind of, you know, crinkled and rolled together. Um, but a lot of times it's differentiating which way the leaf is rolling is gonna tell you uh, which pest is, is causing the issue. If you can't find it itself, the pest itself. So from a monitoring standpoint, there is a commercial pheromone lure that is available. This was developed in Nice Mauling. Um, now, when we first started our monitoring program, um, it was very expensive. So for instance, one lure was anywhere between 80 to $120 Canadian. Um, it's gone down significantly, but though it's still quite expensive compared to, you know, other pheromone lures like oriental fruit moth or codling moth. Um, when we have a, a more local supplier out of Quebec with Salida Pest Supply. Um, and so now we can get a lure for about $10 or so per lure. So because of that, it's not really a, a very economical, thing for growers. It's not really something that a lot of growers will do. Um, it's more monitoring that something like consultants would do. But nonetheless, it is still an option. Um, so what we've used is delta traps with um, sticky liners so that you can remove them. So those would go up. The flight first flight will start about tight cluster to pink. So they're usually we're trying to get them up as early as possible in the season. Um, and the nice thing about those lures is that they do last season long. So that one lure will last you throughout the, the full, um, up until the fall. Um, but so now I've got down here that there's a, you know, there was a threshold that was developed for this. And this is kind of part of the reason, not only because the lures are so expensive, 
but also the fact that these traps don't necessarily give us a huge amount of information in Ontario. Because as you can see, so that threshold that was developed is about, this warrants an insecticidal spray, is about 30 leaf curling midge per trap per week. And based on that, then they estimate, you know, upwards, so basically one male caught would equal about 137 gulls of, per hectare. Um, that's kind of what the damage that one of those midges could cause. But with that threshold of 30 leaf curling midge per trap per week, I'm just gonna show you a video this was from last year, last summer. Um, and this was two days after the liner had been changed. And you can see the midge flying around. They're crawling across each other because there's no more stickiness. Um, and that's common for us to see. So to go at a 30 leaf curling midge uh, threshold, um, we exceed it basically at the very start of the year. So it's a difficult thing to try and and figure out how we can you know, de detect that. Um, the other thing too, based on that, uh, you know, that threshold, how they had you know, kind of estimated that it would be one, one midge would equal 137 gulls per hectare. Well, if we look at some of our trap counts, this is kind of we, you know, our seasonal trap counts, um, we can get upwards of, 100, of, of 1,500 leaf curling midge a day. So we're looking at over 200,000 gulls per hectare per day as a potential damage. So it can really get out of hand really fast, really soon in the season. So we've started to kind of take a bit more of a proactive approach with the monitoring. The traps are kind of a, you know, a no-go. So what are some more um, you know, applicable options that we could do? Um, so what we've started to do is, uh, is our monitoring for egg laying, any signs of egg laying. So again, they're those kind of oval bullet shaped orange colored eggs. They usually have a darker orange center to them when you look under a microscope. Um, and it's all fine to do this, the scope work, but you can actually, once you know what you're looking for, it can be relatively easy to see them just by the naked eye. And you can see in the two pictures on the right hand side, um, those, uh, the orange specks are the signs of leaf curling midge egg laying. And so what we would do would we, um, you know, periodically collect terminals throughout the orchard. Um, you'd simply peel back the older leaves and so that you just have the, um, the young, the newest growth exposed. Uh, and then you're, you're checking either, you know, just looking yourself or with a hand lens or under a microscope for signs of, of eggs. And any sort of sign of egg laying, then a lot of times the approach is that the, um, you know, the prep for putting on an insecticide would be in that following week would be that application. The next stage, if you can't, if you miss the egg laying or you can't necessarily look for it, then looking for those early signs of, of, of gull formation starting. Um, and so that, um, you know, at this point, then it's just starting to, there's just starting to be the, the larval hatch and feeding. So it's just starting to get those curls happening. You can see along the edges of the leaf. Um, and so at this point, then there's still a little bit more exposure for the, um, if you're putting on any sort of, of spray, um, then you can be able to target those, uh, those caterpillars, or sorry, those larvae a little bit better. And then the final part to the monitoring, that stage is kind of looking to, to figure out the end of the generation. So those early parts was when we're putting on the insecticides in anticipation to the generation starting. And we're looking now at this point, the color change to signify the end for when we'll start to see the next phase of adult flight. So I've kind of got then the, the sequence there of those colors like I was talking about. So in the top corner, then we've got the first instars that are the cream color. They start to turn the orange. And then you can see in the video that by the end, they're starting to turn that vibrant, almost neon orange. So once you start to see that, that orange color, then you know that they're about to pupate, especially if you get a good rainfall shortly thereafter. Um, and so then the next flight for adults would be about a week following that, a week to, to 14 days following that. So looking at the, uh, the flight periods and the, the generations that we've got, um, we've done over a number of years, we've looked across Canada, um, looking at some of this growth and it all seems to fall across all provinces. We still seem to follow the very similar patterns um, of three generations per year. 
And now that first generation, I'm just gonna go to that Ontario graph at the top here. We typically see um, the first generation emerging. This is adult flight emerging um, about um, tight cluster to, to pink timing. So then you start to see those curls that start to develop um, and those infested terminals really start to peak about petal fall or shortly after. So that's the first generation that kind of happens over the bloom period. And then we get a next generation that usually starts about a month after petal fall. So then kind of into that mid July timing into August. And then a third generation would be kind of that late August and it goes on into the fall until, uh, until we get a really good hard frost. So the, the kind of key timings for us then, you know, a lot of the focus is more towards those first two generations. Um, and not so much the management into that third generation, just because that point we've already hit terminal set. So there's not a lot of new growth, except for now we're getting into those warm falls and we're starting to see, you know, the terminals growing, having kind of a, a flush of growth again. Um, but typically then we see kind of a, you know, things start to kind of go down a little bit by as we get into the, the harvest timing. Um, the bottom graph that I have here, this is just looking at, again, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty obvious thing um, in terms of the, that, you know, if you have those populations unmanaged, then each generation is going to get larger and larger in terms of populations. And, uh, and you can see that happening between in Nova Scotia, the, the orchards that you have in, that we looked at in Nova Scotia, as well as in British Columbia. Um, but you, you can see here in the Ontario orchards, these three years, we were actively doing petal fall management for leaf curling midge. So it was, I mean, these were all extremely high pressure sites. So it was helping to keep some of those later, later populations at bay. So it really is about early intervention with those first two generations to try and knock those populations down and get things under control. So the other interesting thing that we found while we were doing this work, um, we started to look at the genetics of the, the pests themselves and what we were collecting in the different provinces. And so what came out from this is that we started to actually see that there was a, um, the, the population from Nova Scotia was actually genetically different than the populations that we saw in Ontario and British Columbia. And so what does that suggest to us was either there, those were two separate introductions of leaf curling midge, or that because of the, the regional isolation, is it possible that, um, you know, that over time that we kind of developed these, these cryptic species. Um, what that means though, from a management standpoint is something that we still have to look at and whether or not there could be some differences in terms of susceptibility to certain products, or if there's differences in any sort of biology or behavior between the species is something that we still haven't uh, quite determined yet. So the next thing that I did just want to touch on um, with that work as we were going through some of this, we were looking at um, presence of some of our um, natural enemies, both parasitoids as well as um, predators. And in, um, in the 80s, as I mentioned, that leaf curling midge has been, has been around for some time and management has been looked at. The thing that they were looking at in the 80s and 90s was looking at the release of um, biological controls and in particular parasitic, parasit sorry, parasitoids or parasitic wasps. Um, and the, the one that was really successful was Platygascar demades. And so that was introduced in Nova Scotia and they saw upwards, depending on the, the sites, um, they saw upwards of 40 to 90% reduction in leaf curling midge because of this release of Platygascar. The question though was, I mean, that nothing continued since the 90s of that release. So in terms of the status of what things were like in Nova Scotia, as well as has the, that range expanded across Canada and, uh, and what's the presence of, of these species or others um, in some of the other provinces. So we did some collections. Um, you can see the picture in the bottom corner here is of the rearing lab. And so what we did basically was collect infested terminals. They were put into these little funnels um, and then it was just a matter of identifying what emerged, both the leaf curling midge as well as any sort of um, sort of parasitoids that may have come from that. Um, 
And so, you know, not necessarily surprisingly, Nova Scotia seemed to still have, you know, their the main parasitoid was Platygascar dimates. Um, but interestingly, was the difference um, with some of the other provinces and seeing the fact that we didn't necessarily have um, the same kind of complement of parasitoids. Um, and instead, these were uh, the on, in Ontario, um, they were identified the Lyricus nigranius. Um, this is a, um, a native parasitoid to Ontario. Um, whereas Sinopius miles, um, this is actually a parasitoid that's known for um, parasitizing Swede midge. So there seems to be that there we've got in, in provinces that while they may not be the same parasitoid complex, um, nonetheless, we do still seem to have some um, populations that are around that, um, that could have some sort of impact on leaf curling midge. That said, though, of the sites that we looked at, um, mean parasitism was only, you know, upwards at the, the highest site, um, which was a low input site or uh, nearly organic, but not certified organic. Um, then that level of parasitism was anywhere from two to 40 percent. So not necessarily something that would be um, a practice that would be used alone or relied on solely, but definitely something that is being incorporated into programs. And um, the idea of you know, trying to support these populations, both in terms of providing refuge, as well as um, thinking about the, the products used and some of the, impact, the impacts on these parasitoids. So at the same time too, we also see a lot of predators in those curls. Um, particularly early season. That's, you know, that's kind of the prime time. The petal fall timing is usually when I see a lot of mullen bug inside those leaves, um, but also seeing pirate bug as well is very common. And they're both very voracious feeders of leaf curling midge. So again, it comes to the idea of trying to develop a landscape on the farm that's going to support these predators. So having refuge and habitat um, some people are kind of expanding what they're doing in their row middles and making a little bit more of a diverse landscape to be able to, to um, house some of these predators. Um, also thinking of the products. And in the case of Mullenbug, there's been some growers that are starting to take into consideration the, the food availability that they have with leaf curling midge in the orchard um, and whether there is controls needed for Mullenbug if they start to, to reach Mullenbug thresholds. So whether or not there would, they'd maybe be feeding on leaf curling midge, taking the chance of whether they'd be feeding on leaf curling midge as opposed to causing fruit lip damage. So there, there are definitely um, some options for being able to have cult, the biological control, but it certainly is not something that would be relied on solely. Now, the other thing that we started looking at just this last year, and it, this is kind of a preliminary more just a, you know, for interest sake, things that we started to kind of see common within orchards was looking at what's underneath the trees and whether um, the, the under tree ground cover has any sort of impact on leaf curling midge damage. Um, so again, this is a really preliminary look that we did, but we just simply went to, looked at four different orchards within the same region. So their soil types were the same uh, and growth stages and management were very similar, or sorry, growth, uh, growth styles and, and management were very similar. Um, and so, though, but with those four orchards, despite kind of the similarities, um, we've got the top, the graph at the top is the damage of leaf curling midge early season. So that would be the petal fall damage compared to um, the mid season, the summertime damage for leaf curling midge. And what we were seeing was orchard two and orchard three, despite having a very similar management programs to orchard one and four, had more significant damage uh, from leaf curling midge. So under, once we went, started looking kind of under the, the trees and documenting what it was, again, this was just kind of a, you know, a down and dirty look, um, that we did start to see, we did notice that orchard two and three did have much more ground cover, um, whereas one and four were, um, were more of a bare soil, a common kind of weed strip, the typical what we would see, or the weed free zone. And so once we looked at that ground cover a little closer, we did also see then that those, the orchards that had the higher leaf curling midge damage also had a higher number of broad, um, of broadleaf weeds. So whether there is 
um, you know, something to that. Again, this is preliminary one year, just a couple orchards. This is something we want to look into a little bit more. But, um, but I mean, something like that, providing shelter for leaf curling midge because they pupate in the soil. It's allowing the soils to be a little bit cooler during the summer. There's a little bit moisture um, and they're protected from predation. So there are kind of some benefits to having that. So it's, you know, that, that's why kind of that question came up as to whether there is an impact then of what's happening under the trees uh, in terms of supporting these pest populations. So the last thing that I wanted to touch on was the kind of some of the chemical control options that we've been looking at. Um, unfortunately, in terms of what is registered in Canada, we are really limited with options of what's on labels. So uh, we have we do have pyrethroids that are registered. Uh, we also have suppression um, respire tetramat. So in in Canada, that's Movento that we use. Um, and the, the thing that with Movento is that it's also labeled for post bloom only as well. So it would be for those later um, later stages that we would have that management. Um, but since we've been doing some uh, some efficacy trials over the years, then um, we have looked at some other products. They're just not on labels. So the approach is kind of the uh, you know when you're applying this for other pests that it may provide some some efficacy on leaf curling midge as well. Um, I'll show just a couple kind of examples of, you know, some of the, the trials that we did and then a summary of these products and where we kind of feel that they fit from an efficacy standpoint. Um, but, uh, but our products were Movento. We also looked at um, the group uh, 4C, that's Closer, the group 5s, so Delegate and Twin Guard, as well as Exeril. Um, and there's also been an increase in the number of growers that have started to use summer oils pretty consecutively. Um, and those have had quite a bit of success. So this is one of the first trials that we did where we lo were looking at the, uh, the high and low rate of Movento. This was in an extremely high pressure site. You can see from the, the, um, the purple bars or the checks. Um, this was quite a block to try and manage and this was the first spray. So, I mean, it's not surprising that we still have these high populations. We also put this, this spray was, it was an earlier season. The spray went on on May 28th, uh, but that was a petal fall spray. So nothing was applied early uh, as a pre-bloom. Uh, and then we just went in right at petal fall with Movento, a high rate and a low rate. And you can see that there really wasn't a significant difference between the two rates um, in terms of the management, but, um, but definitely gave um, quite an extended residual in terms of management. And that was two back-to-back -back sprays for Movento, both using the high and low rate. Uh, so we also looked at Closer and Delegate too. This is just some comparisons with that. Um, that first, uh, the first time with it, um, definitely seeing Delegate responding uh, or, or providing a little bit more efficacy. And we've seen that consecutively. Delegate does do a, a, a good job with, with managing leaf curling midge. Closer can be a little touch and go. Um, it seems that the response time using Closer is a little bit delayed. And so unless you get that timing a little bit earlier with closer, then sometimes it seems that it's not as effective. Um, but certainly sticking with closer with the high, like what would be labeled for San Jose scale would be a, the, the closer rate to use for leaf curling midge. Um, and then the, and the graph on the other side is a, com is a comparison of closer delegate and Movento. And I just included this just um, to kind of reinforce the fact that Movento is slower acting. And so um, you're not going to see activity for about a week or two, depending on kind of what the temperature is like. So you can see that that, you know, that first week after application, the Movento or the leaf curling midge levels with Movento are still a little high, uh, but then you start to see that response in the weeks that follow. And they do provide quite uh, some, some pretty decent residual. But when you're working in a high pressure site, you can see then that by week five, those populations start jumping up again. And that's pretty common that we see those, you know, a, a reduction in the populations. But uh, if there's nothing that follows on the subsequent generation, then we can see those escapes happening again. So this is just kind of a summary then of, you know, what we've seen from a product standpoint. 
Um, so Mavento really is kind of our go-to for leaf curling midge control, um, but making use of some of those other products like Closer, Delegate, or Twin Guard, um, you know, as we're putting those on and timings of things like Oriental Fruit Moth and Codling Moth, that they can provide some management. Um, there's also the use of um, pyrethroids, and I'm actually just going to jump to the next screen just so that, oh sorry, it's going to be in a ways a little bit. So I'll, I'll just say it here then, the, uh, the pyrethroids then, um, there is a general trend in Ontario to move away from pyrethroid use just because of beneficials. Um, and so the, the spot you typically use for pyrethroids, those people who, do, uh, who are okay using them, then would be a pre-bloom application. For leaf curling midge. So hitting that kind of tight cluster pink timing with a pyrethroid and then follow up petal fall um, with something like a movento. So before I get into that a little bit more, I do what we have been, because as I just said before about the fact that the timing is really critical, that's what it's about. And so, you know, a lot of our trials, those earlier trials where we were seeing only kind of, you know, 40 to 50% control, um, that a lot has to do with the fact that they were applied too late. So the earlier, the better when it comes to leaf curling midge, once you start to see those galls, it's too late to apply any sort of insecticides. Um, so we've been looking since 2018, we've been starting to develop um, a degree day model to try and have more precision timing with those products. Um, and so this was developed with the Biofix March 1st, base temperature nine degrees Celsius. Um, and what we did was we developed a national degree day uh, model that's for, for all provinces, but then because there is such vari regional variability, then we also have our, our provincial models as well. So I've just got this next page just gives a snapshot of the, that national model, as well as what we've uh, determined for Ontario. And you can see that the numbers that are in bold. So this is looking at 5% emergence, 50% emergence, and 95% emergence. Um, for each of the three generations. Now, again, this is degree days um, for Celsius. So if you're working in Fahrenheit, then you need to do that conversion in terms of those numbers. So we've been validating over the last couple of years using those degree days just to see where we're at um, and how closely they, they work with our trap counts. And, um, and it's, it's, we've had a lot of success with this. Um, in particular, using the Ontario model, it seems to be a little bit more precise with what we're seeing in the field. So this graph that I'm showing here is from uh, 2020 with our trap catches, and you can see those blue bars are the predictions for the emergence of each generation using those degree day models. In 2021, there was some variation, and this just goes to show how degree day models can sometimes be a little tricky depending on what the weather is actually like. Now in 2021, the early spring, there was a lot of fluctuations in temperature. So we would get really warm daytime temperatures and then it would drop quite cool at night. So we were still getting that development, but from a model standpoint, it wasn't accumulating the degree days as quickly. So that's why we did see some activity a little bit earlier before it was actually predicted. <clears throat> I'm just gonna take a drink of water. All right, last slide, just as I lose my voice. Okay, <clears throat> so, sorry, I apologize, I'm on tail end of a cold. So <clears throat> what we've done now at this point where we started to look at those, <clears throat> those degree days is the timing then for the products. So I mentioned already that we've got, sorry, I've lost my mouse now. We've got, we would kind of time that early pyrethroid application. So about that tight cluster to pink timing going on with the pyrethroids. Then following bloom, we're starting to look at the use of those other products, things like closer, delegate, twin guard. Those would kind of fall. We would start thinking about application of those products starting at about 50% adult emergence or a little bit after that. So basically once you start to get peak flight, and starting to drop down. That's when those products would start to go on. Now, we talked already about the fact that Movento um, does take a couple of weeks to come into effect. So having that Movento on as an early petal fall is kind of the ideal timing. So what a lot are doing, those that are kind of having a little bit more of an aggressive approach 
would do that pre-bloom uh, tight cluster to pink, usually a pink pyrethroid application, and then a very early Movento as soon as you can get in. And that would cover that first generation with the Movento applied twice. So uh, you know, a 10 to 14 day um, application interval. The second generation then would be using something like a delegate or twin guard um, or a closer, especially that timing really falls nicely with um, the summer generation control for San Jose scale with closer. So having that on at that timing seems to work really well. Now I mentioned already though that third generation because it is closer to, um, to the harvest time, terminal bud set has happened, a lot of the populations have moved down to suckers if you have a lot of sucker, root suckers in the orchard. So a lot of times that's not actively managed, but nonetheless, those kind of pre-harvest insecticides that are going on for things like oriental fruit moth can help to have some activity. So you do still get some management depending on what products you're using at that timing. And as I mentioned too, that there are growers that are starting to use summer oils more and more. And so, um, and seeing a lot of success with managing midge. Um, and what they've been doing with that has been every two weeks, having oils in the tank every two weeks with their sprays uh, and just keeping a full coverage. Now it does come into play in terms of compatibility and what other products you're putting on. So you do have to be careful with that. Um, but nonetheless, it would be at every two week interval throughout the summer um, and, and pretty, doing a pretty good job with, the, uh, with suppression. So I think that that brings me to the end. I do just want to acknowledge there's a whole group of people that have been a part of all of these projects over the years working across Canada. Um, so I just want to, uh, to acknowledge everybody that's, that's helped with this and been a part of this. And I'll just leave it on this slide. You're we welcome to, uh, to reach out, contact me at any time. Uh, always happy to, to share slides if anyone's interested as well. So I'll leave it at that, Mike. All right, thank you so much, Christy, for a, a great presentation. And I see we do have about 15 minutes or so for questions. Uh, so if folks do have questions, please go ahead and type those into the chat box. Uh, with the amount of people on here, I think that'll be the easiest way for me to, to keep things organized. Uh, and I, I see we do have a, a number of them already there, so I think we'll just kind of walk through them. Um, one other thing before we do, though, I do just want to also mention that before you do head out, if you do want credits, um, again, we will be, we just put into the chat box again, the link for the end of the webinar. So before you leave, do go ahead and, and open that up and, and type in your info one more time so that you're able to get credits for this. So while people are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and look at the questions that are starting to come in. So Krista, we had one question. Um, just curious about the weather effects on the overwintering of the midge. Do you think that yeah. might be playing a role here? I think so, yeah. The, so certainly if we have mild winters, we seem to be having um, much higher populations rate out of the gate in the spring. So they are, so they're gonna be overwintering as kind of pre-pupa stage in the soil. Um, now the question is for overwintering, how deep into the soil they go and how well protected is still kind of a, a good question out there. Um, but, um, but so certainly if, I think if we have, you know, those years where there's good snow cover and they're quite isolated and insulated, um, then, uh, then they can, they can overwinter pretty well. Um, if we get really cold winters, then usually we have some lower numbers. So it's still, that's, that's still something that's trying to figure out what the impacts would be. Okay, great. Thank you, Christy. Uh, we had a question a little, little different, but, um, just curious to know how the Ontario apple market compares to New York. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so so in terms of in terms of farm gate value, um, we uh, we have eighty eight million. Um, what am I saying? Eighty eight million dollars. Yeah, eighty eight million, million dollars farm gate value. Thank you. Um, and uh, so, but about fifty percent of our production on Ontario goes to the domestic market, um, and then the rest is is export. All right, thanks, Christy. Um, we have another question here. I'm interested to delve more into where it's showing up and why. Um, you mentioned that it seems to be worse in the Toronto area compared to Southwest Ontario. Um, Janet said she's never observed greater than 2% terminal infestation. 
Um, so why why is it showing up in certain regions more or less problematically? And I, I guess the the question I'm wondering too. Um, does that mean we don't have to worry about it in, in Western New York or in New York yet? Or does that just mean we have an extra year or two? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question, right? So we saw um, it started primarily in the 80s, at least in Ontario. It was primarily east of Toronto, and it was kind of right at the Quebec border. Um, and so whether that was kind of the introduction of where things started and it's just expanded from there, um, but because of that, then the population pressures have been greater in that kind of eastern area. Um, and I'm seeing some a fair bit of connection with um, more sandier soils, whether that has some sort of play in it, I'm not quite sure. So I can't, <laughs> I can't say as to why. What is it about those regions? It's a really great question. Um, and I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think you're out of the, the woods. <laughs> I think I think it's just a matter of when it's gonna show up. Um, and you know, it's for us, it's been a lot of a lot has been linked to the transitions to different products. So if you're still able to, you know, if you still have significant pyrethroid use, if you still are using um, you know, a fair number of OPs then I think that it's keeping it at bay. It's when we start to kind of reduce some of those sprays that are going on, that's where we're starting to see it. Okay, thanks, Christy. Mm -hmm. uh, someone asked if a videotape will be available. We are recording this, so um, in the next day or two, once we've had a chance to, to get it up online, I'll be sending that out in an email to everybody. Uh, the next question we had is, are all apples susceptible to this midge? Are you seeing any varietal susceptibility or resistance? So, so no resistance, no to resistance when, uh, when that starts to build, then everything seems to be, to be susceptible. I find that there are um, varieties that are more susceptible and those tend to be those that have softer, um, softer leaves. So things like Gala, Ambrosia, Honeycrisp, um, Macintosh, Empire, when you start to get into some of the things like Portland's um, that have a little bit more waxy leaves, they tend to not have as higher pressure. Um, it's also those varieties that tend to send out a lot of vigorous growth. Those are gonna be the ones that tend to be more susceptible. So it's more about the growth and, and what, you know, what those terminals are like as opposed to the particular varieties. Um, we did do, um, we did look at, we had the opportunity because uh, I work at the station with, with Dr. John Klein, who's our pomologist with University of Guelph. So he was doing um, a cider cultivar trial. So we had kind of a replicated trial of 21 different varieties. So we were able to look a little bit closer at that. So I've got the data on cider varieties and their susceptibility, but not as extensive in terms of commercial varieties um, or fresh market varieties. But, um, but the overall, I mean, overall there was pressure in all cultivars with that, um, but it tended to be those that um, really weren't as vigorous growth um, and those that had more, you know, harder leaves is only the only way I can describe it, harder, more thicker cuticle leaves um, had less pressure for leaf curling midge. All right, great, thanks Christy. Let's see, are there any plans to assess soil applied entomopathogenic fungi or nematodes targeting the pupating midges? Yeah, so we're starting to consider entomopathic nematodes. That's something that we're looking at. Um, so I think that there's I think that there's a lot of promise with that um, as, as a possibility. We don't have anything yet, no data yet with that, but that's in the plans. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question, do you think the increase in the infestation in Canada might be due to the loss of organophosphates. Um, you know, do we know how imidan does on 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 midge? It's and Im, so imidan is okay. Um, there's a high possibility of resistance, um, but um, it's not it's not great. Um, but I think it uh, it has in the past. It's been doing the job of keeping it at bay. So we're now restricted with imidan. Um, our uses would be post thinning only and we're only allowed two applications. So the timing for imidan is basically our apple maggot timing. Um, so by that point, it would be, you know, it's too far past the, the kind of the key management time for leaf curling midge. Okay, gotcha. 
Uh, let's see, we have another question. One pre-bloom application of pyrethroid or Movento or both pyrethroid at 5% and Movento at 50%. Yeah, so I think if you're in a high pressure, if you're really trying to get a hold of it, what I would suggest is probably doing a pre-bloom application of pyrethroid followed by a petal fall application of Movento. Okay, thanks. Are your growers seeing any fruit finish issues with the summer oil applications and any varieties you would not recommend that product for? So no, nothing, nothing significant. So um, kind of the key products that we're using for summer oils would be pure spray, pure spray oil and suffix oil um, and no issues from a fruit finish timing. Now they're all, they're obviously very cautious when, when, when they're putting those oils on. So once we start to exceed kind of those high twenties, high 20 degrees Celsius, then they're not putting them on. Um, but so far it's been, it's been pretty reasonable. There's been um, a couple comments, um, some concerns about ambrosia bark, seeing some blistering on the bark and question, question, questioning whether that's oils, um, but nothing extensive at all. And it's been entirely superficial. So it's had no impact on the tree itself. Okay, great. Are there any organic chemical um, as a non-predator solutions? So, um, there, we're still looking at the possibilities of um, getting some registrations. I, we haven't had any opportunities to test any, but Pyganic would be one um, as a potential option. Otherwise, using summer oils is kind of the go-to for our organic growers. Okay. Uh, recommended action thresholds. 60% uh, of infested terminals was the tipping point for the beginning of decline in photosynthesis. And below that, infestation percentage action may not be warranted. So I think it, it, it really varies, in, in, at least in Ontario, it really varies with what the grower feels comfortable with. A lot of times, I mean, 60% infested terminals is a pretty scary thing for some people to look at and not want to control. So, uh, so a lot of times, you know, the, the concern is trying to get a hold of the populations before it gets to that point. So there is a lot of early intervention that people do. Um, so yeah, so that 60% is kind of when we start to really see, um, you know, some profound issues that happen and where, you, you know, your risk of winter hardiness and all of that starts to really come into play. Um, so I would, I would not wait to, personally, I would not wait to that. We don't have any, um, set action thresholds based on research. We don't have anything with that, um, to say really when to begin. It's kind of a personal preference because it's, you know. It's something that's a really obvious thing to see. So a lot of growers want to act on it as soon as they see it to get a hold of it. Okay, great. Are you also seeing higher populations of pyramids and pear blocks? And is the emergent timing similar between the species? No, so not 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 in Ontario that we're not seeing an increase in pyramids. No. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Once you have the midge established in an orchard, is there a way to eradicate them or, or are they pretty much showing up every year? Pretty much showing up every year. We've had a number of um, orchards that we've been working with from the beginning of kind of testing some of our products that have been really adamant and aggressive with their Movento um, and numbers have been starting to knock back, but it's taken a number of years for it to happen. So I don't think, I don't see there being an eradication option for it, but um, but certainly with an aggressive program, you can get them under underhand, but it would be a yearly management. Okay. Um, I see we have a note from, from Greg. He said that it is becoming an annual pest in orchards in the Finger Lakes region of New York, so uh, not great news for us, but good, good to know, Greg. Um, and, and Greg's also asking that you please share the cider cultivar data for him. Absolutely. <laughs> and are those data published? Uh, no, no, it's not published currently, but uh, but it will be, yeah, but I'd be happy to share that. That's no problem. All right, great. Thank you. And have you looked at the use of Apogee and how that might affect leaf curling midge if that slows down the shoot growth? Yeah, and that's one thing that I do want to look more into. I don't think that it slows it down um, enough that it would be, a you know, a a key management tactic, but um, but certainly for the later year, like into the, the summer generation management, 
um, I think that it could have some help of just kind of slowing that vigor down a little bit. Yeah, but that's something that it, we haven't looked at yet. All right. Well, let's see, that's all of the questions I see in the chat box. So if anybody has one more lingering burning question that they'd like to ask, please go ahead and type that in. Um, in the meantime, uh, once again, Jen is putting into the chat box that link for the Qualtrics survey. Uh, so please, if you want those New York DEC credits, make sure you, you fill in that N12 and that you send me a photo of your ID uh, by the end of day tomorrow. Uh, so with that, um, Christy, I'd just like to thank you so much for joining us today, really informative. And uh, I hope you all figure out the solution so that uh, you have the answer for New York. <laughs> Let us know if you figure it out. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> all right, we'll do. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we hope to catch some of you at our meeting in Albany next week. And for those of you from Western New York, they'll be having their meeting in Rochester the following week. And uh, if that's if you're still looking for more information, we're going to have our statewide online on March 3rd. So we hope to see you at some of our upcoming meetings. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everyone.